Howdy, welcome to Elementary Statistics. My name is Lance Curtis and I am the instructor for this lecture which is covering section 2-3, graphs that enlighten and graphs that deceive. Here in this lecture we're going to introduce you to various types of graphs that can be used to enlighten us about characteristics of our data set. We're also going to go into how to use StatCrunch to make those various types of graphs and then We'll conclude the lecture by looking at how we can construct a graph to mislead an audience. So key concepts here in this lecture, in addition to histograms, many of the graphs can represent statistical data. And really what we're trying to do is find the visual representation that most effectively reveals the important characteristics of our data set. Some graphs are less effective because they contain errors. Other graphs are less effective just because of the way that they're presenting the visual data. And then there are other graphs that are less effective because while they're technically correct, they are constructed in a way that mislead an audience. So it's really important to develop this ability, the critical thinking skills, to recognize a poorly constructed graph and identify exactly how it is that it's misleading an audience. First, let's actually look at what types of graphs effectively communicate or visually represent a data set. And when you're talking about visual representations for a data set, you've got to start out with scatter plots. When we're looking at a data set, and I did this many, many times in the real world uh, when I was working in industry, one of the first things we always did with a new data set, make a scatter plot. Scatter plots are also called scatter diagrams. Basically what they do is you're taking <clears throat> plots of paired data and you're plotting them like you would on a uh, standard Cartesian coordinate plane. So your ordered pair of data becomes an X and a Y that you then plot on your, on your graph. Scatter plots are great because they can reveal potential relationships between two variables. So looking at the scatter plot that we have here on the screen, you've got numbers of users versus memory. And we're trying to see the memory that's being used by the number of users. So you've got so many users using so much memory on your computer system, and you're actually able to plot your data points. And it looks like there's some sort of relationship because they're kind of forming more or less a straight line as you go from left to right, right to left. So we would actually conduct further statistical analyses to determine the details of that relationship. Here's another example of a scatter plot that's showing no real relationship between your data points. So here you're looking at a <clears throat> comparison of quality versus price. And sometimes you get good quality for a low price and sometimes you have to pay for the quality that you want. But there's no real relationship here between quality and price. And when I see this type of scatter plot, I like to call this a shotgun effect because it looks like someone took out their shotgun and blew holes in the wall. It's the same sort of pattern that you get. So when you see this type of shotgun effect, that's a real indication to you that, okay, we, we don't really need to look any further into this data set. There's no real relationship here between quality and price. Making scatter plots in StackCrunch is pretty simple. So if we go to our StackCrunch group, let's use the POTUS file, POTUS standing for President of the United States. And here we have a data file that contains the names of presidents of the United States, the age that they had when they were in office, how many days they served in office, the years they lived after they left office, their heights in centimeters, and also the heights of their opponents in centimeters. So what we're going to do is make a scatter plot for the heights of U.S. presidents versus that of their opponents to see if there's any sort of relationship here between the one who wins the election and the one who loses the election. So once we have our data into StatCrunch, go up here to Graph, and then in the drop-down menu, select Scatter Plot. When you do that, you're going to get a options window that looks very much like this. So up here at top, you've got your variables that you can select. 
make sure that you select the right variables for x and y. Okay, so if you want the height of presidents to be on the x-axis, then make sure you put that there. Uh, the height of the opponent on the y-axis, make sure you put that there. If you want it the other way, then make sure you put it the other way. Now, oftentimes when you're reading a problem statement, for example, in your homework, you're going to be looking at this and say, okay, generally what they do is you look at the words and say you want a scatter plot for the heights of U.S. presidents versus that of their opponents. Generally, the x variable comes first because the x is listed first when you list an ordered pair. So this is an indication that generally speaking, when you see this sort of thing, you're going to say heights of U.S. presidents comes first. So I'm going to stick that column here as my x variable and then the other variable, that of the, the height of the opponents, that's what's going to be selected for the y variable. You have another of other options that you can use to tailor make your scatter plot. Most of these default settings are great for our purposes. So you can just go ahead and hit compute. And when you do, you get your pretty little scatter plot here. And wow, look at what we've got. Another shotgun effect. So the shotgun effect tells us that there's no real relationship between the variables we're looking at. And therefore, we don't need to go any further with any sort of uh, more in-depth statistical analysis. What does the scatter plot tell us about a relationship between the height of winners and losers? Well, again, I already just answered that question. There is no real relationship between the two. Next up, we have time series graphs. The time series graph will show us data collected at different points in time. So this particular time series graph that you see on the screen is showing us timber production for different <clears throat> quarters of succeeding years. So here we've got here January representing the first quarter of the year 2000, April for 2000 representing quarter two, July representing quarter three, October representing quarter four. And here we have the production in thousands of tons. And notice the tons is spelled with, with two N's and an E. So therefore, that's talking about a metric ton, like they use over in Europe and most of the rest of the world, really. So here we have a graph that shows us, and we go up and down with the timber production. So as timber production goes up, the graph goes up. As timber production goes down, the graph goes down. And we just follow the graph along to wherever the data points were. They're arranged in order of time, hence the name time series. Making a time series graph in StatCrunch is pretty simple. So again, let's use the POTUS file that we already have opened up. And feel free to pause the video at any time if you want to just go through and try to step through this by yourself. That's perfectly fine. That's, that's one of the reasons why this is on video. So you've got the data set there in StackCrunch. Go ahead and click on Graph. And then in the drop-down menu, down here below QQ Plot is Index Time Plot. So you want to go ahead and select that. And then you get the sort of options window that comes up. Up here at the top, the first thing you're always going to do is select your data set. We're looking at the heights of U.S. presidents, so we're going to select that column right there. And then you've got different ways to format your x-axis. So you can actually have an index that's generated by StackCrunch, or you can put in values here to put in an index of your own. You can have a time index like we saw on the preceding screen. So you can do it by day or by month or what have you. And then you can have a starting year here, increments. You can select you know, it's pretty it's pretty versatile the options you have here for our purposes we're going to go ahead and select custom because what we're doing is we're making the heights of u.s presidents in the order that they were in office so it's it could be it could be considered a time we could put the time in but it'd be much easier to just tell a custom and then tell us that our labels are in this name column that we see here on the left side of our data set it's already assembled there in order for us. And really, we don't really want the years. The graph is actually going to be more readable if we put the names of the U.S. presidents on the graph. Because otherwise, people looking at the graph are going to have to think, okay, 
who was the president in 1824? Uh, most people don't know who the president was in 1824. Come to think of it, I'm not sure I know who the president was in 1824. <laughs> One of those lesser known characters that we talk that we don't talk about so much. Uh, if I had to guess, I'd probably say John Quincy Adams, but. You know, you could probably look that up on Wikipedia. Many of you already probably looked it up on Google already to figure out who was president in 1824. <clears throat> Be that as it may, let's just use the name column there, and it's already there for us. So once we get to that, we select the we selected our appropriate data, and we selected here custom with the radio button, and then we should put the name in. And then we're going to start with the first row, because we want Washington to be first one on the list. So then go ahead and we just click Compute when we're done. And out comes this beautiful little time series graph that jumps up and down as we elected taller presidents and then shorter presidents. There's your time series graph right there. And if you look down at the bottom, you can see names of presidents. So here's Washington, John Quincy Adams, here's Zachary Taylor, so on and so forth. So... This is how you make the time series graph in StackCrunch. Pretty straightforward. Next up, we have dot plots. Dot plots are essentially graphs in which each data value is plotted as a, as a dot along a scale of values. So if you look at what's going on here, here's a data point. Here's, <clears throat> excuse me, data set where we're looking at numbers 0 through 15, and then we're successively counting how many times each, each of these numbers was picked. Uh, so maybe you're looking at, say, like a 15-sided die, and you're wondering, okay, how many times did each number on the side of the die get rolled? And you rolled a certain number of times. So looking at, <clears throat> looking at this data set, each time we have a dot here. So here's so we rolled one one time, so there's going to be one dot over the one. The zero, we never rolled the zero, so therefore there's nothing there above zero. We didn't roll the three either, so there's nothing here above the three. We rolled the four twice, so there's two dots stacked up along the four. There's six times that we rolled a five, so therefore there are six dots stacked up over the five. And the resulting shape of this visual representation is very much like that of what we get from a histogram. But instead of bars, you would see uh, in like a column type graph, you're looking at dots. Again, I don't know if this is something that's giving you any more information than what a histogram would. Uh, I think depending upon, you know, the audience that you're looking at communicating to, some people might think this is more pretty or cute. Uh, I don't make histograms because they're cute. I make them because they're giving me information. So, yeah, I mean, you just have, kind of have to go with the flow of whatever convention is used and with whatever audience you're trying to communicate information to. But there are those, there are those places that prefer the dot plot. So there you go, dot plots. You can make dot plots in StackCrunch. Let's practice on our POTUS file. So here's the data we already have loaded up. Go into StatCrunch and click on Graph, and then Dot Plot there in the drop-down. When you do that, you should get an options window that looks something like this. So go ahead and select your data. And again, most of these default values are going to be fine for us. So we're just going to leave them be. And then we press Compute when we're done. And out comes this wonderful looking dot plot. That looks very much like what a histogram would look like if we were to make one of this same data set. Now, looking at the dot plot, does it appear that the data is normally distributed? Why or why not? I'll give you a moment to, to come up with your answer. Okay, well by now you should be able to tell that this data set is not normally distributed because the shape of the distribution, if you're going along connecting the tops of each of these columns, you don't get that normal characteristic bell shape where you start low, come up high somewhere in the middle, and then come back down low again. 
Next up, we have stem plots. Stem plots are also called stem and leaf plots. What they do is they basically take numbers and they split them off into segments called stems and leaves. So here in this data set, we have uh, stems, which are, which are here basically representing the tens place of your number. And then the leaf is representing the ones place. So the first value in our data set is 10, because we take the one and we put the zero after it, and, and that makes 10. The next number in our data set is 13. We take the one, put a three next to it, and that makes 13. So 13 is the next number in our data set. It's a different way of representing the numbers within a data set. So again, this third value that we see here, the six, that's the leaf. We're going to put that next to the one. The one and the six brought together gives us 16. So that's how you're, you're actually reading your stem and leaf plots. Now, you can, you can <clears throat> make the attachment between stem and leaf at any point along the number. So we don't necessarily have to do it between the tens place and the ones place. We could do it between the ones place and the tenth place there at the decimal point. Or we could do it at the between the hundredths place and the tenths place. We could move that around wherever we want to along the length of the number. And usually you want to put that in a place where it's most convenient to look at the data. So here we are looking at a data set that's between 10 and 58. This setup where you're actually using the tens place as your stem and the other numbers as your leaf, that's, that's pretty much the optimal way to, to go with this. Note that repeating values are stacked, just like we saw in the dot plot. So here we've got two 35s in our data set. So the first one's listed here, the second one's listed here, and then the next data value is 36. So we're stacking similar numbers. So go ahead and just repeat that because that's good information that's being revealed in the stem plot. If you don't report those repeated values and how often they're repeated, then there's a portion of the information that could be communicated that you're obscuring. So you want to make sure that each individual data value in your set actually has representation here in your stem and leaf plot. You can make stem and leaf plots in StackCrunch. Again, we'll go back to our POTUS file. So here when you click under graph, you're going to come and click on stem and leaf. And then that option will pull up an, op an options window that looks something like this. And then you're going to select your data set here. One thing you need to note is that typically up till now, we've actually been leaving a lot of the other default settings alone. But here you're going to want to actually change one of them. Here's towards the bottom where you see it says outlier trimming. You're going to want to collect, click on the radio button next to none. You don't want StatCrunch to eliminate outliers from your stem and leaf plot, especially when you look at it for the first time. The outliers give us information about the data set and about particular points within that data set. So when you first look at this, you're going to want to include the outliers. You don't want StackCrunch to cut those off. Now, depending upon how you finalize the information and how you present that in your, in your final presentation, you may want to trim some of those outliers out especially if you're only focusing on the main group in your data set. But for an initial first look, you always want to select none so that you can get the whole tamale and not just a few of the internal ingredients. Once you have that radio button selected, go ahead and click on Compute, and this wonderful stem and leaf plot will come up. The thing that I like about the stem and leaf plots in StackCrunch are that here it tells you where it's actually making the separation. So there's no confusion about where that's actually going to end up. So here this just says leaf unit is one. Decimal point is one digit to the right of the colon. So this first number that you see here is 163. Next we have 168 repeated twice. Then we have 170 repeated twice, so on and so forth. So this eliminates a lot of the confusion about where is the break off between stem and leaf. Keep in mind that there are different ways to make stem plots. This is basically the default way that you see in StackCrunch. 
But there are other, uh, I guess, circles out in the world where they would actually stack the stem plots uh, to be more compressed. So here you actually see, see how there's two different stems for 16, but the first one is actually listing 0 through uh, 0 through 4, and then the second one is listing 5 through 9. There are those that make stem plots by just not making that separation at all. So for 16, you'd only see one 16 here on the stem side, and then everything else here on the right for all the leaves. They wouldn't separate it out as 0 to 4 and 5 to 9. They wouldn't do that. There are also others who make variations of stem plots by <laughs> orienting them vertically and not horizontally as you see here. So here where everything's going left to right, they would actually turn this around and you'd see the stem and leaves going up and down instead of left and right. Just be aware, it's just a different format, but you still read and interpret the stem plot the same way. Now, looking at this at the stem and leaf plot, remember we, we said we don't want to trim any outliers. So the question we have looking at this for the first time is, do any outliers appear in the data? Well, I hope you said no, because that's exactly what we have here. There's no outliers. There's no single uh, points that are out here off in a distance. So, no, all the data appears collected together. There are no outliers in this data set. Next up, we have bar graphs. Bar graphs are simply histograms for categorical or qualitative data. So, looking at the vertical scale, we've got frequencies or relative frequencies. So these are either counts or percentages. And then the horizontal scale, there on your x-axis, is identifying different categories of qualitative data. So I really love this graph here. It says, what kind of pets do you own? And cats come out on top. Yes! As a cat lover, I love this graph. Cats rule because dogs drool. And then, of course, you've got you know, smattering of other animals, rabbits, goldfish, hamsters. Yeah, they're kind of cute to look at, but the cat, the cat is where we want to be at. So if you're a cat lover like me, then yeah, give me a high five next time you see me. And if you're a dog lover, well, please don't hold it against me. I'm still a good guy. We can make multiple bar graphs if we put two or more sets of bars together on the same plot. So here we have an example where people were asked, what's your favorite milk drink flavor? And they're asked to... They're asked to distinguish between chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry. And then notice how we've got different colors representing different groups. So we've got young males in blue, young females in red, and then senior citizens in green. I kind of have some questions about this particular multiple bar graph. I mean, look at it and just kind of interpret it to see what, it actually, what it's actually saying to us. Okay. What it's actually saying to us is that there are more women who prefer, I mean, young women who prefer vanilla milk over chocolate milk. Does that make sense? I, I'm just, just asking a question. I'm not making any judgments here. I'm just asking. I mean, I could see it would be okay for the young men. Okay, but the young women, I'm thinking, why wouldn't they go over the chocolate milk? I just, I, I, maybe there's something here I don't know about. Maybe it was like a convenience sample, so it's distorting the data and not very characteristic of the whole population. I don't know, but <clears throat> just, just asking the question, not making any judgments, just asking the question. So that's the kind of thing you want to do, though, when you're actually looking at these graphs, is look at the data, make comparisons, ask questions, say, does this make sense? Is this telling me something that actually makes sense? That's something that you always want to get in the habit of doing. Again. Statistics is more about critical thinking than it is about math. And we're not going to look at how to make the bar chart because we've already looked at that when we were making frequency diagrams. So we're going to move on now to the next type of graph, which is a Pareto chart. Pareto charts are like histograms, but the bars are arranged in descending order according to count. 
So you can make these with, you know, frequency or relative frequency. It doesn't matter. The effect is still the same. So whereas if you're just making a simple, a simple frequency, uh, <clears throat> simple frequency graph, then yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just a simple bar chart. And the order of the categories is the order that whatever they come in or the order that you put them in. Here, a Pareto chart is just like that. But the main difference is, and it's an important difference, you must arrange the bars in descending order. So the highest count goes on the left. The next highest count goes next to it. The next highest count goes next to it, so on and so forth. So you get this shape of a graph that starts high and eventually comes down to the lowest value there on the other side of your graph. Pareto charts are based on the Pareto principle, also known as the 80-20 rule. And for those of you who don't know, the 80-20 rule says about 20% of your efforts will produce 80% of your results. Pareto charts are extremely useful. I use them all the time when I was working in industry. So what we would do is we would actually set up frequency tables where we're actually looking at, we're counting the number of times a particular component or system failed for a given failure mode. Then we would make a Pareto chart with that information. And it was great because what the Pareto chart tells us is, okay, this stuff over here on the left, that's the, that's the big, and it's, it's really great to see this in visual format because it becomes very obvious. This stuff over here on the left, is what you need to be focusing your limited resources on because all organizations are limited by by money by time by uh, resources physical resources uh, by energy by uh, manpower well, you're limited in so many ways so you want to know where you want to put your money to get the most bang for your buck and when you're looking at trying to fix failures of components and systems out in the field you really want to focus on the stuff that's giving you the largest headache. The Pareto chart is perfect for telling you where your biggest headaches are coming from. The Pareto chart was actually comes from a guy named Wilfredo Pareto. Uh, it was so this eighty twenty rule that comes from uh, it's called the Pareto principle actually comes from this guy in eighteen ninety six. He actually published a paper in which he. Uh, listed some observations uh, from which the Pareto principle was formulated. And so a couple of those observations you see here on the screen. You notice that 20% of the population owned 80% of the land in his home country of Italy. He also noticed that 20% of the pea pods in his garden produced 80% of the peas. And he looked at all sorts of different uh, scenarios and found that this 80-20 principle is pretty much across the board. You could find lots of examples from uh, no, disparaging fields of study and the 80-20 rule was pretty much holding on. The thing with the Pareto chart is that it helps us to identify the vital few that produces the vast majority of our results. And that's why as a reliability engineer I was making these Pareto charts because yeah we can see the stuff over here on the side it's giving us the biggest headache. Here in this particular Pareto chart, you're looking at cost. So if you want to know how to reduce your costs, make a Pareto chart of all the different things that you have to pay for, and then look at the big stuff over here on the left. So in this example, parts and materials, manufacturing equipment, those are the two big ones there. So you want to put your efforts into figuring out, okay, how can we lower the cost that we have for parts and materials? How can we lower the cost for manufacturing equipment? Find ways to do that without sacrificing the quality or other values you have in your business. And this tells you where to get the most bang for your buck. Making Pareto charts in StackCrunch is fairly simple. So let's go ahead and use the POTUS file that we've been using previously. If you go up to Graph and then select Bar Plot right up here at the top. And then you get two options, with data and with summary. Since we have actual data here, we're going to select with data. If we had a tab, like a frequency table, then we would select with summary. But we have the actual data, so we're just going to select with data. When we do that, we get an options window that pops up that looks like this. So the first thing we're going to do is select our data. 
And then down here for the def most of the default options are going to be fine for us, except remember the Pareto chart, we have to order the columns in a specific manner from the highest count to the lowest count. So to do that, we're going to go down here to this field called order by, and we're going to click on this little arrow so we get the drop down, and we're going to select this last option there called count descending. So what this does is it counts from the highest descending down to the lowest. And once we have that selected, then that's the key factor that will give us our Pareto chart. Once we get done, we click compute, and out comes this lovely little Pareto chart that shows us the heights of U.S. presidents. Now, one thing to notice about this, we're not actually looking at failure modes of an engineering system, but oftentimes when you're looking at real-world data, especially when it involves equipment, then what you find are these little plateaus. So here's the highest point right here. And then notice how there's a plateau here, a little flat space. And then there's another little flat space here, and another flat space here, and, and another flat space here. So you'll see variation in the data set, but it's also often that you look for plat that you see plateaus in your data set. And those plateaus are really important to notice because they're separating out the things that you want to be paying attention to, what an engineer would call signal, from the things that are just distracting you and just obscuring, the, obscuring your attention from what you really need to place it on, what we would call the noise. Okay, So all of this down here, if these were actually in failure modes instead of actual heights of people, then I would look at this and say, okay, all the failure modes that come down here at the end, don't even bother with them right now. Okay. Don't even bother with them. That's just noise. The big things you want to focus on, right here, okay, up at the top, before this first plateau comes up. Pie charts are something that most people are familiar with. They depict qualitative data as slices of a circle, okay? So it looks like, you know, pieces of pie. So, you know, here you've got, uh, see what you got. You got your pumpkin, you got your blueberry, you got your, uh, let's see. I kind of like strawberry pie, yeah. What kind of pie is green? Key lime pie, yeah. We're going to get key lime pie here. Purple, uh, I was trying to think purple. Um, do you know when I see purple and I see like, you know, that means like, I think grape when I'm thinking food with purple, but I never had grape pie. I just, I just yeah, it doesn't. So purple is going to be like uh, Matilda's surprise pie. And then this other blue right here, we're going to say is, uh, we should we already use blueberry over here. So we're going to use the blue. Uh, yeah, I'll think about something about that and get back to you on it. So here we've got <clears throat> pie charts. Everyone's pretty much familiar with the pie charts. And you can use frequency counts or relative frequency where you have percentages like you see here. So here's an accounting of someone's <clears throat> personal spending. And they're spending almost half their money on rent. It's not atypical. And then almost a fifth of their money on food. And then you can see utilities, fun, clothes, and phone. Um, obviously, I don't, I don't see, I don't know what this is. I'm trying to think, is this like a guy or a girl that made this out? Because you would think that clothes would be grouped under fun if this is a woman. But then again, maybe not. I don't know. But again, I'm just trying to ask, I'm just trying to interpret the data, ask questions, all that kind of stuff. Phone for 5%. Wow, you wouldn't just put that under utilities. That's interesting. So, yeah, so it's just a pie chart. Pie charts and stack crunch are pretty easy. So just go to go to graph and on pie chart. Usually you have data, unless you have a summary table, in which case you're just going to select with summary. If we use our POTUS file to make a pie chart of the ages of U.S. presidents, not the height, but the age, we just come here and select graph pie chart with data. The options window pops up. We're going to select age here from the list. It tells us where our data is at. And then notice the different options that we have here. Most of the defaults are fine for us. And so I'm just going to leave them as is. Okay. Notice that we have two defaults selected for the display. Count and percent of total. Okay. I'll show you how that rolls up a little bit later. But as I said, the defaults are fine for us, so we're just going to hit Compute. And then when we do that, 
whoa, what happened? StatCrunch gives us this little message here that says, we have lots of unique numeric values for age. Want to turn on binning for this procedure? Generally, when you see this window in StatCrunch, you want to hit yes. Click OK. Okay. And what StatCrunch will do is it will bin the data for you in the format of, it's like, it's like, it's like you were making a histogram or a frequency distribution, but it's in the form of a pie chart. So you just want to go ahead and click OK if you ever see that. And here's what comes out when you do that. So notice we've got the bins that it created. So here we've got 40 to 45, 45 to 50, 50 to 55, 55 to 60. It created the bins for us because we put that OK button there. And it automatically colored them for us. Now, some things to notice. Look back at the options window where we had those two display options selected, count and percent of total. That actually shows up here in the legend. So the first column, the first category, 40 to 45, 2, 5.26. So 2 is the count, meaning there's two presidents that were aged between 40 and 45. And that represents 5.26% of the whole. So the count gives you this number here. Percent of total gives you this number here. So if you select only count, you don't get the percentages. If you select only percent, you don't get the counts. That's the link here between what you see and what you actually picked out. Notice that we're ordering by value ascending. Okay, So notice how the bins are ordered in value ascending. 40 to 45, then 45 to 50, then 50 to 55. You can change that order by selecting a different option here under order by. Here, notice a little bit lower in the options window. Start angle is zero. So the lowest, the bin with the lowest value, 40 to 45, okay, actually starts here. And the edge of that bin or that category is right here at zero degrees. Woo! Yeah, let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. So that's a zero degrees. If I change that to say 90, then this, then this edge would actually be straight up and down. So it would actually rotate my pi uh, chart according to however where I actually wanted it to start. And notice that it proceeds in a counterclockwise direction. Okay, that's just the default that's that's organized there inside StackCrunch. So <clears throat> there's your pie chart. Now we're ready to talk about frequency polygons. Frequency polygons are essentially histograms, but they don't have the bars. Instead they have lines that connect what would be the top of the bars. So as you can see here in this example here on the right, We've got number of persons versus weight, and so we've got the different bars here for each of the different weight categories, and then we just take the center point of the top of each of those bars, and we connect them with a line, and that makes our frequency polygon. You can make a relative frequency polygon that uses relative frequency instead of counts. Again, you're going to get the same basic shape with your graph. Here we have on the right, uh, test scores versus frequency, so this is actual counts, how many people scored a particular test score on a, on a given test, and so we see just basically connecting the dots, there is your frequency polygon. So each of these dots represents the top of a bar from what would be a histogram, and that's, that's really all you're looking at. To make frequency polygons in StackCrunch, uh, requires a two-step procedure and this is not particular to StatCrunch. Most statistical software packages that would make a frequency polygon actually works the same way. Okay, And it's just the way that the people that put this together think. So first what you have to do is make a frequency table and then use the StatCrunch to make the graph based on the frequency table. Now I know that Making the frequency table is something that a computer would be very adept at. So why they didn't program that into the software to do it automatically, I, I have no clue. Okay, But obviously I'm not the one that put it together. So just learn how to do this and you can just run with it just fine. So first we're going to have to make a frequency table. And for an example, let's go back to using the heights of U.S. presidents. So we're going to go back to our POTUS file. And we're going to first have to make our frequency table. And the easiest way to do that is to make a histogram and put the counts above the bars. And then we just basically translate that 
into our data sheet to make our frequency table. So first, if you haven't done already, open the POTUS file. You should have that open. And then once, the, once you get to the data sheet, then go to Graph and Histogram. And you'll get an options window that pops up and looks like this. Again, select your data. And then make sure that this checkbox after value above bar is selected. You want to check that box after value above bar. And that's going to be really helpful to you when you go to translate the information from your histogram back into StackCrunch again. Once you do that, go ahead and hit Compute there at the bottom of your Options window. And then you're going to get a histogram that looks something like this. Okay, With this histogram in place, we can now make our frequency table here. So height of the opponent was the edge of the data file. So in the very next column, and it doesn't matter where you do this, I just picked the very next column because it's convenient. And go ahead and, and put in the height in centimeters. And this is where you're going to put the labels for your categories from your histogram. So looking at the histogram down here, we've got 160, and then the next number listed is 170. But there's a division here between them, so that's going to be halfway between. And so this is 165. So then the first category is going to be 160 to 164, because this edge right here is the left edge of the next category. So 165 to 169 is going to be that second category. And then 170 to 174, 175 to 180, so on and so forth. Then once I list the different categories here, now I'm ready to list my counts. And so I just go ahead and list that as count. And then this is where I just have the numbers above the bar. That's why you check this checkbox over here, value above bar. It makes it really easy. I just pick the numbers right off the top. 1 is the first one. 2 is the second one. 8 is the third one. So on and so forth. I'm just picking the numbers off the top of the bars and putting them here in the column. Once I have my frequency table created, now I have the information that I can feed back into StatCrunch to make my frequency polygon. So let's see how that's done. So now that I've got the table, I go back up and select Graft, Chart, and then, and then in the next menu that pops up after Chart, I select Columns. There's an Options window that pops up, looks like this. So first I'm going to select the column with my data. The data is in the count column that I created from taking the top of the, that histogram off. So I want my frequencies to come up. That's going to be the data that I look at. A little, a little lower, you're going to see a label called Row Labels In. And inside that field, you want to, you want to make sure that you select a column with your height. That's where you put the category labels. So you're looking at the 160 to 164, 165 to 169, so on and so forth. You want those to be the labels for your categories in your frequency polygon. Then a little, a little lower, you see, you see an area labeled plot, and you want to click that little arrow so you get this drop down here. The default selection is horizontal bar split, but what you want to do is select points with connected lines. That's going to make our frequency polygon for us. And so once we select points with connected lines, okay, now we're ready to press compute here at the bottom of the options window, and now pops our beautiful frequency polygon. Note that it has the same basic shape as the histogram that we used to create the frequency polygon. So if you go back and actually Go back to this frequency table and create a, a histogram with that data, the histogram that we used to actually make the actual frequency table. Okay, and you actually connect the tops of the bars. That's how you make the frequency polygon. Notice how we have the same basic shape as the frequency polygon. And that's because that's all a frequency polygon is. Last up on the list, we have Ogives, or Ogives. I can never get the pronunciation of this right. So an Ogive is a line graph that depicts cumulative frequencies. So essentially what we're looking at here is a frequency polygon that's organized on a cumulative basis and not just a count basis. 
Uh, ogives can be useful for finding percentiles of the proportion of data values between two given values in the line. So here in this example, we've got glucose blood levels, and then we've got different counts, and, it, and we're actually measuring it after fasting. So we've got, you know, only a handful of participants who have, you know, blood glucose levels below 60. And then as you start rising the, the blood glucose level, you start getting closer and closer to 70. And, uh, or actually more and more participants. Um, actually, no, it's cumulative. So 70, 70 looks like to be the number of participants total. And so you're looking at, here's the total number that's below this, this particular point. So, you know, right here where it's about, oh, I'd say it's about what, 79 or so. You've got 40 participants. And then here at 109, you've got 70 participants that are below 109. Making OGIs and stack crunch. Okay, again, you're going to go through that two part process where you have to uh, make that frequency table. But because it's cumulative, you've got to make a cumulative frequency table. So first we're going to make our table, make the cumulative counts. Go back here and, and it's really easy. Just set up another column and then you're just going to add what's here. So one actually goes over. It's the first one. You're going to take one plus two which is the next value there. That's going to give us three. And three plus eight gives us eleven. So on and so forth. Once we have this table then we return to the options window under graph chart we get back to our options window. We're going to select cumulative because our data is now in this column, not the count column, but the cumulative column. And then all the other uh, <clears throat> options that we did before, we're just going to keep those the same as we did before. So make sure you select the same row label and you're going to keep plot with points with connected lines. They're already organized uh, in the cumulative fashion here in the table, so there's no need to change the order. So then we come down here to click Compute when we're done, and out pops our ogive. Now that we've looked at uh, effective ways to communicate data, so now we're going to look at ways in which data can be uh, communicated deceptively, or, or ways in, that obscure the, the underlying data that we're actually reporting on. So here in this first instance, Non-zero axes are very common, especially to people who are pushing a particular agenda. The graphs are misleading because uh, by not starting the axis at zero, they're on the y-axis, you're not starting at zero, and therefore it exaggerates differences between things that otherwise wouldn't be. So here we have an example where we're looking at three models of cars and comparing the highway fuel consumption in miles per gallon. So Notice how it looks like there's quite a bit of difference here between the Honda Civic and the Toyota Camry with the Chevy Aveo here in the middle. And it looks like there's some substantial difference, just, just looking visually. Don't look at the numbers, just look at the visual representation because that's what most people look at when they see a graph like this. Well, the axis doesn't start at zero. So what if we were to redo this graph but actually start the axis at zero? What would it look like? Well, it would look something like this. And this is the reason why somebody made this chart. Presumably somebody who wants you to buy a Honda Civic. They actually made the chart this way because if you actually start with a zero axis, notice how there doesn't seem to be all that much difference between the highway fuel consumption for these three models. They seem to be fairly close. That's because they are fairly close. If you look at the numbers there on the left side of the graph, Toyota Camry coming in at 31, Honda Civic coming in at 36. Yeah, 36 is better than 31, but is it really significantly better? Uh, to me, it's like 36 and 31 are kind of in the same ballpark. And that's what this graph communicates here on the right, which is the way it should be communicated. Don't be exaggerating these differences by starting with a non-zero value there on your axis. You want to make sure that you're not distorting people's perception of what the data is really, really having to say. Pictographs are another way in which people communicate data in misleading fashions. 
pictographs are basically graphs created with the drawings of objects. And they create false distorted impressions of the data. So often you're using three-dimensional objects when you're when you're creating a pictograph. So you know if you're if you're trying to uh, give us a graph about expenditures, you use money bags or stacks of coins. People are often used for population sizes. Barrels are often used to communicate oil production. Houses could be used when you're looking at say like house sales you know, for given years. So, I mean, there's different ways to go about making the pictographs, depending upon what you're doing. But generally, you're using some sort of three-dimensional object. And here is why they can be especially misleading. Because they're using areas and volumes uh, in ways that, when you actually do the math, you can see that it doesn't add up. For example, let's say you have a square so if you want to double the side each, each side of the square because that's what you're doing you're making a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional object so if you take the side of a square and you double it the area doesn't double the area actually increases by a factor of four and the same thing with the volume you're gonna double each side of a cube then the volume doesn't merely double it increases by a factor of eight so these types of Three dimension, using two-dimensional uh, representations of three-dimensional objects really doesn't communicate <clears throat> the differences uh, between the values that are listed here. The other thing that you notice is that where exactly uh, are the data points here in this graph? So I'm, look, uh, I'm guessing it's a trash can, so I'm guessing I'm looking at some type of trash consumption. Is this like the output from a given community? Is this the trash that's come into a certain uh, land dump? I, I have no idea. But looking at where the trash cans are located, it's like, where exactly are the numbers? Is the number the, the top of the trash can itself? Or is it the top corner of the lid? Because here, if it's, if it's the top of the can itself, I'm looking at somewhere about 50. If it's a top corner of the lid, I'm looking at 100. Same thing here. What am I looking at? Am I looking at something that's, say, like 120? Or am I looking here where it's like 170? I don't really know. The, the pictograph is kind of misleading in that way. And the sizes that are represented, what's the real difference here? I mean, this looks to be maybe twice what this is? Or would that be two and a half? Would that be three? I don't... I don't really know what's going on with this graph. So, because <clears throat> when you double the side of, a, of an object, it doesn't necessarily, you know, double the area of the volume. It, it creates a graph that can be very misleading. A better representation would be just, just tabulate it. So here, especially since I've only got three items to, to look at, it's much easier to communicate that information in a, in a small little table like this. Then there's no question what the values are, and it's really easy to see the differences between the values because there's only three numbers. So here's some important principles to consider when making visual representations of your data. There's a guy named Edward Tuft. He's a leader in the area of visual representation. Uh, if you haven't looked into his work, uh, or you don't know anything about him, I highly recommend giving him a look. I don't completely agree with everything Tuft has to offer, but uh, there are some things that he does recommend that make good sense to me. Here's a few of, of those suggestions and recommendations. First, if you have small data sets of 20 values or fewer, use a table instead of a graph. That makes perfect sense to me. And what we were just looking at on the previous slide with pictographs is a good example of that. It's just better to just give us the just straight numbers route if we don't have that many to deal with. Now, if you do have a lot of numbers to deal with, and many real-world data sets do, I mean, I was dealing with some data sets that had thousands of, literally thousands of data points. And in that case, you don't want a table, okay? You're going to want some type of graph to visually represent your data. The graph should make the viewer focus on the true nature of the data, not other you know, eye-catching, distracting elements. So sometimes people that are making presentations like to put in all these funky animation features, colors, and make it like a real entertainment show. And that just distracts from the actual data itself. 
make the presentation so that you're focusing on the data that you're trying to communicate because that's what's going to drive everything. That's the whole reason why you're having a meeting is to understand the data and the implications that come from that understanding. Don't distort the data, okay? Again, like we saw with the non-zero axis, okay? Construct a graph that reveals the true nature of the data. Don't, don't distort the data to forward your own agenda. Almost all the ink in a graph should be used for the data and not for other design elements. So make sure that you, again, you're going to focus on the data and not on the actual presentation of the data. That's all we have for this lecture. Uh, if you have any questions, you know what you need to do. Otherwise, I will see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.